gardeners everywhere, we welcome you. This is Mid-American Gardener. I'm looking at three really talented people next to me, and we are going to answer some of your questions, so get ready. My name's Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department, and so my area is cut flowers, landscape, things along that line. But who else is here? Let's find out and let's let them tell us what their expertise and we'll probably do some uh, viewer emails as well. Let's start with you, David Robson. Thanks, Diane. Hi, I'm David Robson. I'm a horticultural specialist at the university right here, as well as a pesticide specialist. Uh, I have a question from uh, somebody in Springfield who wants to know about castor beans. Uh, she says that they're quite good looking and unusual, and of course they are, and wants to know if they're toxic to animals or humans. Are they unlawful in the state? We will get to that. Are they an annual? Are they easy to reseed? She just wants to know how to grow the plants, basically. Well, castor beans are an annual. They are very tropical looking. They can get eight, 10 feet tall, have large leaves. Uh, they usually start out as green, but some of the newer cultivars are more of a burgundy leaf one. They will have a flower and they will produce the seed. And of course, it's the seed that is very toxic. Uh, you, can, uh, you can actually die from eating the seeds and that has been uh, shown quite often. Animals can die also. You probably get a dog maybe who will eat a seed. Cat will just go right past it. Castor beans are used to ring a property. If you don't want moles to go into your property, there's some uh, action there that's been discovered at Michigan State University. They are warm loving, they like lots of water, they will produce seed, but the seed won't last during the winter time, so you either have to start your own plant from seeds that you've saved, or buy plants at the garden center nursery early in the spring. Again, give them bright sunlight, give them lots of fertilizer, you're really not growing the plants for the flowers, which aren't that attractive, so a well-balanced fertilizer, or maybe one higher in nitrogen should be good enough. Did you answer about it being Illegal? Illegal. It is not. It is not unlawful. Just, I don't know of any state that it's unlawful in, but it is poisonous and yeah. there are some uh, things that you can derive from the seed which are illegal themselves, right. but the plant itself is okay. not. I just wanted to have you clarify and, and make sure. And somebody can do more internet search so we don't have to promote what it can produce. Yeah, and we don't know anything. But it is beautiful. Uh, it makes a wonderful shade plant because it grows fast and put it on the west side. And it gives and a tropical look. It looks just great around. Beautiful. Uh, and it makes a big fast screen too yes. if somebody wants to block Love the view. Love that. Well, that was a great question. Thank you, viewer. Thank you, David. And let's go on to you, Marty Alanya. Hello, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper. I enjoy um, perennials, um, shrubs, trees, more than annuals. But, you know, sometimes I'm forced to grow them as well, particularly for <laughs> tomatoes. I mean, if you have a bit, well, anyway. Um, we have a question here from Madison, Fort Madison, Iowa. So thank you for writing in to us. Um, this man wonders if putting a granular fertilizer on his entire garden now would be a good idea over the snow to help everything grow better in the spring. The soil is sandy, and he says he doesn't have the resources to amend it and needs a quick, easy solution. It's difficult for him to get around. So I would say, Randy, that I, I wouldn't recommend that. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Usually those fertilizer, granular fertilizer is designed just for the season, really. I mean, and also I, worry, I would worry about the birds eating it off the snow, and it's not good for them. Um, I would also consider this. I know you said you don't have the resources to amend your soil, which obviously you know compost is what you really need. But, um, I mean, certainly a granular fertilizer when you, on your garden, on your vegetable garden in the summer. But... Um, I don't know if you do your own cooking. I don't know how difficult your disability is, but um, if there's any kitchen scrap at all, start putting that on the garden. Just throw it out there. You know, after the freeze, after the vegetables are done, put it out. I don't know if you have a raised bed or what you have, I would assume you do. Um, just put that on there. It'll break down coffee grounds, banana peels, everything, eggshells, great. Put it all on there. Just make, you don't even have to have a tumbler to make compost, just put it on. It'll happen. Um, compost is really what you need. If your soil is that loose, you're not going to be able to 
help it with granular fertilizer, you've got to amend it somehow. Um, that's that's it, and it's just, I mean, compost is the easiest thing in the world. It happens every second. So consider that, please. And, I, you know, like I said, certainly granular, you know, once your plants are in, you can side dress them, but it's not going to help your tilth, and that's the problem. So Get that organic matter up. You need it to hold the moisture. You have to, because it'll okay. run right out. Well, thank you, Marty. And now we go to you, Doug Williams. Hi there. Hello, how are you? I'm Doug Williams, and I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Landscape Architecture here at the University of Illinois. And I have a question uh, that's quite seasonal for this time of year, and it's about the amaryllis. And the amaryllis is uh, native to uh, South Africa, and it is a tropical um, bulb, one of the largest bulbs in cultivation. Uh, Tracy from Bloomington asks, uh, she has an unusual question. She says that her amaryllis, one of her amaryllis, actually bloomed three times in one season. Uh, and my response to her, why that possibly could have occurred, uh, possibly two uh, reasons. One is that it was either stressed, uh, but more than likely with her planting it outside, there probably was a lot of organic matter, and um, she probably had superb growing uh, conditions. And then by bringing it in with plenty of sunlight and other conditions, um, it was allowed to send up uh, three stalks in one season. Typically, uh, the bulb will flower once and have um, <clears throat> four trumpets, pretty much in four different directions uh, that will come up. They're relatively large, usually in the warmer colors of reds and some uh, white uh, mixtures as well. Uh, this was uh, George Washington Carver's favorite uh, bulb, by the way. Uh, I just happened to know that fact. Uh, having worked on his birth site in Diamond, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to have your amaryllises bloom, uh, you can still continue to fertilize them um, when they're indoors. Uh, I have some right now that are growing in rocks from a friend of mine who uh, uh, allowed, to, allowed me to have them when they d couldn't place them into their new uh, living location. So I've been blessed to have those. So um, if you have three blooms, that's great. Um, maybe you can take them to the show and get awards. If not, just enjoy those blooms and uh, share them with us next time. They're doing something right. I Must be. Is. That was interesting about the amaryllis. That's the most I've learned about it. Very good. Right. Thank you, Doug. Well, say, we're going to go to a special Did You Know next. <laughs> a little information about tomatoes and this is so great we're going to go to line one and Tony has a question about tomatoes hi there Tony line one doing great tomatoes and I grow about probably in the neighborhood of about 150 plants per year I got a garden about 50 by 70 and they're spacing about six feet apart in cages. And you told us last week that it's not wise to put tomatoes back on tomatoes. What can you do to the soil to make sure that your crop is going to be a good crop the next year if you put tomatoes back on tomatoes? Well, the first thing I would think of is absolutely cl clean up everything at the end of the year. Sanitation. Yeah. Absolutely, Absolutely clean. <laughs> and I never have the soil without it being mulched. I just don't let the soil pop back up. And I don't, I don't do tomatoes on tomatoes, so I'll turn that over to anyone else. And I would say you would need to make sure you removed, you know, we say sanitation. That's not tilling it in. That is just Re pulling everything gone. out, yeah. putting it in the compost pile. If something is diseased, you see it starting to wilt, die, you get any of those leaf spots, blights, you get rid of that plant, that material, and get it out of that area. Uh, and like you say, mulching. As long as you can keep that vegetation and the fruit off the ground, you're going to limit any of that stain in that area. And it sounds like you cage yours, so that's Which is good, good, good. good, good air good. circulation. And it's he, more than likely he's growing a lot of different types of tomatoes mm -hmm. too, which is even better. Okay. So. Uh, keep growing the different types right. and if you can't rotate at least rotate the types 
True. might be, you know, if don't yeah. grow all of the plums or the cherries or the well, beef steak. Well, 150 in the plants is really impressive. Well, I'd like to get some of that <laughs> tomatoes here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tony, we are very impressed with you, but try to keep it as clean as possible. Yeah. And rotate types, that's yeah. good. The problem is that there's always disease in the soil, and there's some on your plants as well, no matter how healthy they look, there's always a little bit of black spot or a little bit of something, a little bit of botrytis, and it's going to get in the soil. That's where it lives. And that's where it'll return to. And if you are not scrupulous about picking up every bad leaf, it starts there, and then it'll just proliferate the next season. That's the problem. So, so there's our suggestion. Have Thank you, you for your question. A hundred by seventy. You know. <laughs> Corn yeah. in one side, tomatoes in the other. <laughs> so, but we thank you for that question. And we're going to go on next. And this is a great question, too, about amending soil on line two with Shirley. Shirley, line two. Um, I appreciate you taking my call. Thank and my you. My question is I have a small area next to White Rock Driveway, which probably some rocks have gone into that garden. And I tried putting flowers there, and they do poorly. So I've decided to pull the flowers out this year and try to put a few vegetables in. But I want to know, how do I amend, or what would you put there to, I mean, I don't know whether to get a load of mushroom compost or just till it. I just don't know what to do to make the soil better. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the, <clears throat> here's the fun part. You get to test your soil. Get a little soil test kit at your garden center and test your soil and then you'll know what you need to do. Certainly, compost is never a bad idea. You're just not going to over compost. You just aren't going to. But, especially when you said there's white rock along the edge there, you're going to get some leaching. That's usually limestone rock and it. The soil might be a little, the pH might be a little too high or higher than you want it to be. So, just test the soil. It's very simple. It's, and it's fun. And it's easy. And it's educational. So, um, if you don't feel like you're up to it, which you totally are, if you don't feel like you're up to it, take a couple soil samples and um, take them to the plant clinic, take them and have them tested. But you can easily do this and then you'll know what to do. And it's very likely compost is involved. Oh yeah, you know, I'm you know, guessing. And just find some plants that uh, match that pH and you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. And I know that at least a little bit on the alkaline is um, baby's breath, lavenders, dianthus. Mm -hmm. But she wanted vegetables. She wanted vegetables though. Oh, so see, I'm thinking flowers. No, I'm thinking she, potatoes she are about the flowers. only thing. Yeah, I can't think of anything besides potatoes. Yeah, like a sweet. Right. Yeah. But so. again, but with then the you soil can test, she can add the mm -hmm. sulfur mm -hmm. to bring that pH and, down and, and then. And match what the bag says. Do not think that you know better. Absolutely. You know, really do what the yeah. bag says. A little goes a long way. And, and it also, may be yeah. to the point where she can't modify the soil and is going to have to make a raised bed in that area. Well, and then that's... And, and that way, do that. then that she can grow. That would be a great yep. way to go. Right. There you go. And there then go. put a few flowers in there anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Peas. <laughs> Possibly an herb garden. <laughs> or some potted plants. Yeah. Or some go. potted plants. I, I, <clears throat> amaryllis. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you, Shirley. And we want to go next to line one. And Kent has a question about roses. Hi there, Kent. Yes. Uh, I was wondering where could I get a couple blue roses at? I've raised roses for probably 33 years. Mm -hmm. And I want some different colors. I'm looking all around well, on the table well, here. If you want blue like my shirt, you're just out of luck. But, you know. <laughs> now, what do you really mean, Marty? What are you really <laughs> saying here? Well, there are no blue roses. Yeah, that's what there we're saying. I mean, blue it's, roses. But there certainly sort of are shades of purple. Purple out there. Um, and Angel Face is one of my very favorite varieties of rose ever. It's a nice silvery lavender with a ruffle on the edge of the petal. It's floribunda. So it's got a great lavender, silvery shade and uh, intrigue is a deep dark purple and I'm I'm pulling ones out that I know you can find I know you can find them blue the skies is a hardy anywhere. shrub rose that came out of Iowa State University but go. it's sort of again the purplish yeah color how do they get the florist roses that blue is it dyed they're still purple the, the blue blue ones are absorption dye yeah absorption they're dyed, dyed. but 
Yeah. There really are just the purple ones as a florist rose. Yeah. But if it's violently blue, it's fake. It's absorption dye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the orchids they have that. Right. Oh, very as well. common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's it's violent blue. Yeah. I can't I can't it's describe it any other way. Flowers. Yeah. There are there are flowers that come in that shade, but roses are not. Okay. One of them. So there are some oh. ideas for you. Blue is not always blue in the name. It's no. often yes. lavender. Yeah. Tulips the same way. There are not blue. No blue ones. Tulips. Yeah. Okay. That's well, what we're going to go. Is for. That's <laughs> what squill is for. That's what squill is for. It's blue. Squill and yeah. then hydrangeas and, and gentians. Yeah. And iris. And there and right. There's there a there lot of blue things. You just can't get <coughs> them not every roses. single type of yeah. flower. Well, let's go back around and do some emails and some other viewer questions. So, uh, David, we'll start with you. Um, I have a question about garlic mustard, which is uh, oh, wow. a weed that you probably have seen maybe in your property. Oh. Anybody who has some wooded property oh, is probably seeing a lot of garlic mustard. Uh, they have one and a half acres. They pulled 20 bags out of it. They have trout lilies and spring beauties coming up. I suspect that there's a lot of other things in there. They want to know if there's a nice way of getting rid of garlic mustard without harming the trout lilies and spring beauties. Well, garlic mustard is a biennial, and that's the first thing you need to know. The first year, it'll produce a small rosette of leaves. The second year, it produces the white flowers that are cross-shaped. Uh, it's relative to the other brassicas that we have in the vegetable gardens. And actually, it was brought over to the United States as an herb in the, in the early 1860s. And like the dandelion and the house sparrow, it just found a perfect way of just going all over the place. It would be great if deer ate it. Deer do not eat it. Deer do not like it because of the garlic taste of the leaves. And of course, they go after the other plants then. And so garlic mustard can only really be pulled out. If you keep pulling it out uh, before it starts blooming, that'll help. If there's a way to get in there as it's starting to flower, and as you see that stalk starting to rise and you cut it off, that'll mean that that biennial will die because it won't keep trying, it may try to flower again, but usually once or twice and that's it, which means that it's gonna be two years to fully try to control it since it is a biennial that some's flowering this year, some flowering next, producing seed in the plants in the opposite years. Just keep pulling and pulling, but realize also that animals can transport it, the wind can transport it. Uh, you may have one and a half acres of woods and if there's any other woods around it, it could be blown in. But it's one of those things that if you catch it when it's young stage, get it when it's first starting, and it looks kind of nice and pretty and it's blooming in there, but it will take over. And it has some of that allelopathic action that it actually will prevent other things from growing, like the spring booties, the trout lilies, and the next thing you know, the only thing on the florist, uh, forest floor is the garlic mustard. I don't want to recommend any chemicals for it. Basically, since you have uh, a lot of wildflowers in the area, and they'll probably be blooming at the same time as this. I think it's going to be a lot of physical labor uh, going out there. After dinner, pull a bag next night. After dinner, pull a bag next night. After dinner. And again, some people eat the darn stuff. I think it tastes terrible, but you know, <laughs> that's my feeling of beets, too. Work on developing a taste for garlic mustard. I guess. Children. <laughs> <laughs> Very good primer on garlic mustard. Thank no you. Kidding. Now, Marty, what you got? Um, Sandy didn't get all her bulbs planted in the fall. That never happens to any of us. I don't know what's wrong with Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> I have found. Yeah, I'm totally. I'm totally joking. I found tulips in the back of the refrigerator. I'm like, well, when are those? Anyway, um, she has them in the garage for the winter, which is good. If you know, I assume it's unheated. Is there any way I can save them and plant them in the spring? You can, but you can also pot them up and give them a little cold treatment in the refrigerator for a couple of months and bring them back out and have them bloom in the pots. And then, after they bloom for you in the pots, then you can tip them over, let them die down, and plant them in the fall, and they'll bloom for you next spring. So you can double duty, or you can just hold them, just wait, but keep them someplace cool, not too dry. Sometimes so they will fall. deplete yeah. their reserves, and you'll be able to tell yeah. that. They won't be great, but you they'll know, they'll after they're in the ground another year, I mean, if you're not in a violent hurry, and it depends on what they are, she doesn't say what kind they are. Yeah. But um, certainly daffodils I wouldn't worry about, <laughs> but tulips, yeah. So 
Okay. You can try both of those options. And what I find is if the minute you purchase them, you plant them, and you're oh, yeah. much more likely to get them in the ground. Oh, with yeah. With a good bulb auger that somebody gave yes, you. Yes, yeah. with a good power planter, bulb auger. That's great. All right, thank yeah. you, Marty. They're, they've ridden around in the car with me for a long time, too, and yeah, I totally get it, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Doug, what you got? What's your question? Well, I have a, for you. a real easy one. I was uh, delighted to get it, and I was able to identify it. Um, the plant ID, uh, one of the uh, callers sent in an um, image of uh, a plant they wanted to identify and I looked quickly at its catkins or its uh, flowering structures as well as its um, uh, undulating leaves with the uh, impressed venation and noticed that it must be a, a hazelnut or filbert. Um, I don't know which particular species but uh, it has also the brilliant red fall color. It goes in nice combination with other uh, plants that have a similar texture as well as fall color. I'm thinking of sumacs, viburnums, mm -hmm. as well as uh, oak leaf hydrangeas, um, things of that nature that have not only floral displays but also wonderful fall color and uh, coarse and um, a beautiful texture. So that's what you have is a hazelnut or filbert and um, treat it as such. It's beautiful in the fall. Nice. Wow. Oh, yeah. I love those. That is really pretty. Well, good. That's really fun to get to see some plant IDs. We like that, especially when we've got the plant ID specialist here. As long as you give us a good enough picture, it should work. Well, let's go to line two next. And Karen's got a question for us about mulches. Hi there, Karen. Hi. Now, I have a small garden. I plant about three tomatoes and maybe mm -hmm. a dozen peppers and some potatoes and a few squashes. And I also have arthritis, so it's making it difficult. I have two different types of mulches in mind. Mm -hmm. One, I have a black paper mulch, and then I like to use straw also. Can I put black paper down for about two weeks and then put straw on top of that so that the ground will warm? Uh, can I double mulch like that? I don't know. I don't know why. Not. I not. can't see any reason why not. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> I think yeah. it's a really good idea. And the black paper mulch would it's just gonna break down decompose. Anyway. Sure. Sure. You it'll, get the straw. it'll do its job to get the ground warm. And that's a really good idea. And the straw Great will idea. break down usually yeah. within a year or two, too. Uh -huh. So let's... Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're thinking about stealing your idea. Yeah. Well, test it out and let yeah. us know. Yeah. yeah, test it because that black should mm -hmm. warm things up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most people use plastic, but you have to then take it back up. Yeah, paper's a lot better idea. Yeah, I yeah. like yeah. that. It is. And then the straw is not in con contact with the soil, so it's not breaking down very fast. So it would add good, did you say tilth? I didn't, but I would. No, I would, I would, good, I'd totally, I'd say Good organic lot, matter. <laughs> I didn't this particular time, though. Sounds like yes. a fun science fair project. <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds good. Very good. Well, thank you. I think you've got a great idea. Well, we want to go next to the little mag quiz, and here it is. Well, while we're waiting for a phone line to come through, we're going to talk about what can we do right now to get ready for the garden or to do gardening things. Who wants Start to jump in? I'm looking at Doug. He's looking at me. <laughs> can wait. No. <laughs> <laughs> wait till next year. <laughs> I start my own plants, so okay. it's almost time. It's okay. almost, almost time. time yeah. Yeah. And I make sure that all my tools are really sharp at this time. I take a Saturday afternoon mm -hmm. and I bring all the shovels and the hose and I put a nice edge to them and people don't think oh you know you buy them once that's it but if you make a nice edge every year with a good file and almost to the point where it's going to cut your skin it's so much easier to dig into the soil whether you're using that spade or that shovel and then with that hoe just to cut right across the top to get the weeds but mm -hmm. and then the clippers and the pruners and everything nice. so they're all oiled they're all sharp they're all ready to go if and when it ever warms up did you say if and when? When? <laughs> if and when. <laughs> well, I'm still actually looking through seed catalogs. That's exactly Mine are just yeah. starting to arrive. I don't. Yeah. 
You got a few picked up. I buy locally a lot, so I don't yeah, you know, I do a whole too. lot of seed catalogs, but you know, yeah. I, I so enjoy them. And purchasing <laughs> locally is good because, well, I do try not to look at the seed carousels and all the, pla but I you do can't like help it. it. You can't <laughs> help it. Oh, you can't, you can't help it. You well, cannot. then I guess I would say you need to plan before you start looking too, and yeah. that's something been, that a lot of people don't do. I've that's been true. planning, and that's a good time during some of these football games that we had earlier on. And during Isn't the basketball games now, it's yeah, we could no other it. reason. <laughs> but not during, you know, yes. special events, but yeah, Correct. during some of those seasons. Well, yeah. thank you folks for watching. It's always fun to talk about plants. I want to thank you folks for being here and all your thank expertise. You. We hope that you plan to get out and garden. And when it gets nice, get out there and have a great week gardening. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.